Welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Before each of the world wars, a keen observer could sense that the world political order was unstable. Look at the world in 1939, for example, at the dawn of World War II. The old imperial powers, France and Britain, are badly damaged from World War I, and while they're still powerful, they're in a slow decline. Germany is rearming, and Hitler has already snatched up Austria and the Sudetenland. Italy has been occupying Ethiopia for years, and Japan is two years into its invasion of mainland China. And Joseph Stalin, the Soviet dictator, is also rebuilding his army. Anyone can see that war is about to break out. Maybe they don't know exactly when or exactly where, but this situation is untenable. And if you go back to 1914 and the beginnings of World War One, you also see inherent instability. It's just a different type of instability. The Balkans are a powder keg, with countries like Serbia having just gained independence from the decaying Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And the Russian Empire also has interests in the area. You also have two formal alliances that look equal on paper, the Germans and the Austrians and the French and the Russians. And if the British are formally allied with the French before the war, if they have a definite defensive alliance, the war probably doesn't happen because the Germans and Austrians would be fools to go to war with the Russians, French, and the British. But there's diplomatic ambiguity, so an incident in the Balkans ends up precipitating a global war. And what I want to talk about today is a similar situation. I'm not talking about an identical set of alliances, but I'm talking about a similar unstable global situation, the perfect storm of events that would produce the Seven Years' War, better known to my American audience as the French and Indian War, which is the name for the part of the Seven Years' War that takes place in North America. The war begins in 1754 in North America and in 1756 in Europe. And leading up to it, there are two main threats to European stability. First is the rival between Austrian Archduchess Maria Theresa and Prussian ruler Frederick the Great. As you will recall from previous episodes, the two have very little in common. Maria Theresa is a Catholic, and Frederick is a Protestant. She's an expert diplomat who likes to build alliances for the long term. He's more than happy to discard alliances that don't suit him. Maria Theresa is a faithful wife and mother with a cheating husband. Frederick is a notorious philanderer known for his many affairs with women and men. And, oh yeah, there's that whole war of the Austrian succession we discussed in the last few episodes. If you want the Cliff's Notes version, Frederick invaded a Central European territory called Silesia that is part of modern-day Poland. That area had belonged to Maria Theresa, and uh, a general European war had broken out, but in the process, Maria Theresa was never able to get Silesia back. But she remains determined, and she has a new ally this time around in the 1750s. She has the Russian Empress Elizabeth Petronova. But Maria Theresa still has to worry about Austria's old arch-rival the French, and she tries to make France into an ally by working diplomatically through King Louis XV's mistress, Madame de Pompadour. And Frederick the Great of Prussia, who famously calls these three women the first three whores of Europe, he makes his own arrangements by forging an alliance with the British, 
and in 1756, war is about to break out over Silesia for a second time. And again, if you want to understand the full background in Europe, listen to the last three episodes, Prussian Roulette Parts 1 and 2, and No Stable Peace. But the conflict between Maria Theresa's Austria in southern Germany and Frederick the Great's Prussia in northern Germany is just one of the two threats to European stability. The other threat is the conflict between the British and the French, which has simmered ever since the end of the War of the Austrian Succession in 1748, but it has never fully ended. Now, the two nations are officially at peace, but while there is peace in Europe and India, and North American settlements that had been taken during the war are transferred back to their original owners when the war ends, there is still a lot of disputed territory in colonial America. At the time, the British control what is now the U.S. East Coast, with the exception of Spanish-controlled Florida. They also own the Hudson Bay Territory in northern Canada, as well as Newfoundland and peninsular Nova Scotia on the Canadian East Coast. The French control the rest of modern-day Canada, as far west as Lake Winnipeg. From here, south through the Great Lakes in the Mississippi Valley, the French claim most of inland North America. However, there is a dispute over whether the French or the British control the Ohio River Valley, with both sides laying claim to the area. At the end of the War of the Austrian Succession, France and Britain establish a joint commission to resolve the issue along with some other territorial disputes. However, the commission is not able to reach an agreement. They agree that France is to own the Ohio River watershed, which flows west to the Mississippi, while any land south of the St. Lawrence where the water flows into the Atlantic will belong to the British. But they can't agree on where exactly to draw the line. Where exactly does one watershed end and the other begin? So the two sides engage in a period of intense negotiations with Native American peoples in the area. Right? They are trying to get support from the locals to sort of establish de facto control. Right? This is how the French have gotten to control most of their territory by building diplomatic alliances with various Native American tribes, and then they move in and build some forts, and they are able to trade and uh, catch furs in the area. This has been French policy for some time, and this is something that the British now want to do. And these lands in the Great Lakes and the Ohio River Valley and upstate New York are the territory of the Iroquois Confederacy. And both the French and the British are trying to establish a toehold. Now, Traditionally, the Iroquois have been friends with the British, and they have been enemies with several Native American tribes who are friends with the French. So this area has been hard for the French to kind of get a toehold in, while the British have had successful diplomatic efforts. And uh, this comes to a head in 1753, when the French say enough is enough and they just move into the area south of Lake Erie and build a set of forts near modern-day Erie, Pennsylvania. And this follows on the heels of some massacres of the French against the Native Americans trying to force the Iroquois to agree to their presence, which they won't do, so things are very tense, and when the French start building these forts in Iroquois territory, the local Mohawk chief, uh, Hendrik the Anagoyan, personally travels to notify New York Lieutenant Governor George Clinton that French are in the area and that they have invaded Iroquois land. Why is 
the chief from the area of Erie, Pennsylvania, going to notify the New York governor that something's going on. Well, at this time, the borders of uh, the modern U.S. states are not well defined in the West, and New York and Pennsylvania have separate competing claims on the area. And this is why Chief Hendrick goes to the governor of New York and not the governor of Pennsylvania. But Clinton does not want to risk a fight with the French. He's a lieutenant governor, not the king, and he doesn't have the authority to start a war. And this makes Hendrick angry. The Iroquois and the British at this time are supposed to have a defensive alliance. Uh, For Hendrick, that should be good enough. Uh, But Clinton instead asks Hendrick to wait for the Albany Congress. This is a planned meeting of several colonial delegates and Iroquois chiefs. And if the Albany Congress agrees to do something, well, that would give Clinton a little bit of political authority to go ahead and maybe do something. But uh, Hendrick doesn't want to wait. He says that's not good enough. The French are moving into his people's lands now and that if Lieutenant Governor Clinton doesn't do something about it, the covenant chain is broken. That is a big deal. The covenant chain is the formal alliance between the British and the Iroquois Confederacy. And while Governor Clinton is trying not to engage in foreign policy here, it seems that he may have lost the British Empire a much-needed ally an ally that occupies the Ohio River Valley, this uh, disputed area. Now, in July of 1753, the Albany Congress does indeed meet, and they do a little bit of fence-mending with the Iroquois, but the colonies cannot agree on a single set of terms for how this alliance is actually supposed to work. Some forward-thinking delegates, among them Benjamin Franklin, propose forming a union of colonies with a government of elected delegates overseen by a president appointed by the king. This would make it easier to conduct relations. But this proposal goes nowhere, since none of the individual colonies want to give up their own quasi-semi-independence, right? Better to only have to deal with the king as far as uh, higher political powers are concerned than to have to deal with this colonial council and this president, right? And the British Board of Trade in uh, Britain, which uh, is also a party at the Congress, well, they don't want the idea of a union of colonies either. They prefer the colonies weak and divided so they can control trade. So instead, any agreement has to be approved by all 13 colonies, the Iroquois delegates, and by the way, there are six Iroquois nations, and then uh, His Majesty's Board of Trade also has to agree. So at the end of the day, what happens is that the Iroquois agree to become British subjects. This is a complicated subject in and of itself. Basically, the Iroquois recognize this as a formality. They still consider the Iroquois Confederacy to be an independent nation, this becoming of British subjects is just symbolic to them. And the colonists, for their part, well, they also see this as nothing more than a formality. It's just a way to form some sort of an alliance. But to the British crown, this distinction is crucial. See, they're now going to argue that the Ohio River Valley is actually British territory, not French, because it is inhabited by Iroquois peoples who are British subjects. This will also become important after the war for reasons we'll get into later. And that is where our story begins. I should point out that most American historians consider the French and Indian War to be separate from the Seven Years' War. And many European historians also take this view. 
This is understandable. The French and Indian War is caused by French and British colonial conflicts in North America. The Seven Years' War is caused by Austrian and Prussian territorial conflicts in Central Europe. But I consider them linked in the same way that the Pacific and European theaters of World War II are linked. They have different causes and sometimes different combatants. There are no Chinese in the Normandy campaign and there are no Germans in the Pacific Islands, but there's so much overlap that we're talking about one and the same war. And that's how I'm going to approach these events. There are also several parts of this story that tie into nationalism, the theme of the season, and I should flag them here at the beginning. In North America, the Seven Years' War lays the foundation for the American Revolution. British policies after the war will anger many colonists and lead to many of the grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence. In Europe, the Seven Years' War will create an even more powerful Prussia. And this powerful North German state would, down the road, eventually form the core of a unified German empire with massive implications for the idea of nationalism. And in India, the war will end with Britain as the sole colonial power, which would eventually lead to a period of complete British dominance, after which India would never be the same. And finally, before we go any further, there is a map in the episode description. The geography can be a bit confusing in an audio format, but all the relevant areas are on the map, except for Nova Scotia. Now, our story begins on April 22, 1754, in Alexandria, Virginia. A small force of Virginia militia under the command of 22-year-old Lieutenant Colonel George Washington is preparing to embark for modern-day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And if you want to know why a Virginia militia is in Pennsylvania, that's another one of those colonial boundary issues. Virginia also claims land in the area at the time, and Virginia's governor, Robert Dinwiddie, has ordered Washington North to help enforce that claim. And this claim, by the way, it's made through what we might call a public-private venture funded by the Ohio Company of Virginia, in which Dinwiddie is an investor. Now, a couple of months back, Dinwiddie had sent 40 men under the command of William Trent to establish a fortification at the convergence of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers, where they joined to form the Ohio River. Dinwiddie has sent Washington with 168 men to follow up. Now, Today, we know Washington as the leader of the Continental Army and America's first president. But at the time, he's just a young militia lieutenant colonel, albeit one from a wealthy and influential family. He's supposed to have been second in command of this expedition, but the expedition's commander, Joshua Fry, is still raising more men, and Haste is needed, so Dinwiddie orders Washington on ahead with the 186 men he's already managed to muster. On his march north to join Washington with the rest of the regiment, Fry will unceremoniously fall off his horse and die from his injuries, leaving Washington in command of the Virginia regiment. Unfortunately, there has been a problem. On their way north, Washington encounters Trent and his 40 men coming back south. Apparently, they had just started building their fort when a French force of 500 men showed up and demanded that they leave. The French were polite but insistent and even purchased the Virginians' construction equipment, but Trent had no choice but to withdraw. 
and now these 1,000 Frenchmen are building the fortification instead, and they call it Fort Duquesne. This puts Washington in a bind. See, along with Trent's militia were a group of Native Americans led by a man named Tanakarissan. Tanakarissan's people are called Mingos. These are a group of people from mixed Iroquois tribes who have recently settled the Ohio River Valley. Tanakarissan himself was born near modern-day Buffalo, New York, probably into the Catawba tribe. We can't be sure. As a young man, he was captured by the French during a previous war before eventually being released and adopted into the Seneca tribe. At some point in the 1730s or early 1740s, he would resettle to the Ohio River Valley. Tanakarissan would later claim that the French boiled his father alive. This would be uncharacteristic for the French, who was we'll see, were generally far kinder colonizers than the British or especially the Spanish and Portuguese. But whether or not Tanakarissan is exaggerating in this case, he does have a very good reason to hate the French. Remember when I said the French had recently massacred some Native Americans in the area? Uh, Well, these were some of Tanakarissan's people who had been killed. And Tanakarissan isn't just a warrior. He's what's called a half-king. Not a chief, but a major dignitary, analogous to a secretary of state, if you want to fit the idea into a Western system of government. Uh, And Tanakarissan is the guy who actually asked the Ohio Company of Virginia to build a fortification at the headwaters of the Ohio to begin with. He wants to keep out the French at any cost, even if that means allowing the British to build a fort. This is controversial among the local Native Americans. Many would rather see the French occupy the area, since the French colonization means that the only white people around will be a few soldiers and fur traders. A British fort means farms, families, and towns full of European settlers. But Tanakarissan leads the anti-French faction, and he's refusing to leave the area around Fort Duquesne. And Washington actually knows Tanakarissan. The two of them had worked together the previous fall on a diplomatic mission to the French. So, Washington's natural instinct is to help. But even if Washington and Tanakarissan joined together, Washington's 186 men and Tanakarissan's few braves won't be enough to fight off the French. After conferring with his officers, who were mostly older and more experienced than him, Washington decides on a middle course. He will not engage the French without waiting for Fry and the rest of the regiment to catch up. At this point, Fry is still very much alive. However, he will move his men to within 40 miles of Fort Duquesne, and begin constructing a new fortification and a base of operations. He also writes a letter to Tanakarissan telling him that help is on the way, and he signs it with his Iroquois name, Kanatakarius, which means devourer of villages. The calf king had given Washington this name in honor of his great-grandfather, John Washington, who had earned the nickname by massacring a bunch of the Iroquois' rivals, the Algonquins. Washington hopes to earn trust by using his Iroquois name, and it seems to work. The half-king continues loitering in the area of Fort Duquesne, and he keeps sending Washington intelligence on the French movements, although Washington's interpreter is barely literate and struggles with the translations. Washington is aware that his little army is outmatched, 
His new position, a place called Redstone Creek, can only be reached by a narrow forest path. So he's not going to march straight there. If the Virginians are to stand any chance at intimidating the French out of the area, they will need to bring artillery, which they expect Colonel Fry to be bringing, and this means building a road for that artillery. So starting on April 25th, the Virginia Regiment starts clearing trees and leveling ground. But they crawl forward at a grueling pace. Washington is also keenly aware that he's conducting foreign policy here. He sends word to Virginia, updating Dinwiddie on the situation and urging Fry to hurry. He also sends messages to the governors of Maryland and Pennsylvania, updating them on the situation as well. But as we will see, his handling of his army on the tactical level is questionable at best, as is some of his decision-making. Right? In some sense, this is quintessential George Washington. Right? He is a great organizer, a man of great character, dare I say, a terrific politician, but a mediocre tactician. We should also remember he's 23 years old at this point. Right? This isn't George Washington, the elder statesman. This is George Washington, the junior officer, just earning his spurs. Anyway, the road building proceeds, and nearly a month later, on May 24th, the Virginia Regiment is little more than halfway to Redstone Creek. But a message arrives from Tanakarissan. The French have sent out a scouting column of around 40 men. Now, remember, France and Britain are not at war. And while Washington has been authorized to use force if necessary, the French scouts have not. Their leader, Joseph Coulon de Villiers de Jumonville, is carrying a diplomatic letter demanding that Washington's men withdraw from French territory. But Washington doesn't know what the intentions of these scouts are. He just knows there are 40 heavily armed Frenchmen in the area looking for him. So Washington orders his men to dig in and build a defensible position. Unfortunately, it is springtime in southwestern Pennsylvania. The ground is soaking wet, and the trenches are muddy, cold, and uncomfortable. On the first night in camp, a sentry hears footsteps in the woods. He shouts an alarm, and the defenders fire a volley, but no attack comes. In the morning, one of the companies comes up six men short at roll call. Turns out those footsteps were deserters fleeing the camp. The next two days pass in uneasy anticipation, with scouts roaming the woods and watching for French soldiers. Then, on the morning of May 27th, a frontiersman named Christopher Gist walks into the camp. He is another old friend of Washington's, and he reports that a group of 50 Frenchmen have just passed his cabin, where they threatened to smash everything in the house and kill his cow. According to Gist, these scouts may only be a few miles away. Washington immediately orders 75 men to pursue the French. And this is probably foolish, Seventy-five Virginia militia are no match for forty to fifty French regular soldiers in a straight fight, but the militia and the French manage to miss each other in the wilderness. Washington does not know this and can only wait for word, but at eight o'clock in the evening, a Mingo messenger named Silverheels arrives from the Half-King. Tanakarissan tells Washington that he has found the French scout's camp and that he's waiting nearby with 12 Mingo warriors. 
Washington takes 40 men under his personal command and takes them on a night march of about six miles, following Silverheels to Tanakarissan's position. In the pre-dawn light, they can make out around 40 Frenchmen. Jumonville has not posted any sentries, so Washington's Virginians and Tanakarissan's Mingo are able to surround the French camp without being detected. It's a rainy night, so the French have stacked their muskets under an overhanging rock to keep them dry. As the Virginians and Mingo approach the camp from opposite sides, a few French soldiers have managed to light fires in the wet conditions and are preparing their breakfasts. What happens next is controversial. Washington's account is brief. He writes, quote, we were advanced pretty near to them, as we thought, when they discovered us, whereupon I ordered my company to fire. Mine was supported by that of Mr. Wagoner's, and my company and his received the whole fire of the French, during the greatest part of the action, which only lasted a quarter of an hour before the enemy was routed. We killed Mr. de Jumonville, the commander of that party, as also nine others. We wounded one and made twenty-one prisoners, among whom were Monsieur Lafarce, Monsieur Drouillon, and two cadets. The Indians scalped the dead and took away the most part of their arms. Unquote. Well, that's not very much. How about something a little more colorful? The following account comes from American military historian Edward G. Langell's excellent book, George Washington, A Military Life. Langell writes, quote, It was seven o'clock in the morning. Captain Stephen led twenty of the Virginians on one side, and Washington commanded the others. The half-king and his warriors drifted silently from place to place around the perimeter, which progressively shrank as the Virginians crept closer to the campfires. Then... Washington rose from shelter to give the order to attack. He startled an enemy soldier who sounded the alarm. The French scrambled for their guns, and Washington ordered his men to open fire. The battle, such as it was, took no more than 15 minutes. Jumonville's men never had a chance. When the firing stopped, about 10 or 12 Frenchmen lay dead, and two, including Jumonville, were wounded. The large proportion of dead to wounded has led some historians to claim that a massacre took place after the battle and that Washington covered it up. In fact, the Indians butchered some wounded Frenchmen while the fighting still raged. Far from trying to conceal this, Washington told Dinwiddie that six Indians who lacked muskets had served to knock the poor unhappy wounded in the head and bereaved them of their scalps. Apparently, he thought such behavior was typical. Twenty-one Frenchmen survived as prisoners and one escaped. Only one Virginian had been killed. Unquote. In his report to Governor Dinwiddie, Washington would write, quote, I can with truth assure you that I heard the bullets whistle, and believe me, there is something charming in the sound. Unquote. He had won his first battle, if you want to call it that. But there's a problem. Jumonville is dead, and that's where the controversy comes in. See, Jumonville was indeed carrying diplomatic letters and qualified as an emissary. He should not have been killed. According to Washington's account, Jumonville appears to have been killed in the initial volley. At least Washington makes no mention of Jumonville saying anything, so it sounds like there is a firefight and this guy is caught in the crossfire and that's what happens. But according to most of the other accounts, after Washington's men fire their first two volleys, Jumonville shouts for everyone to cease firing. And at this point, he may or may not already be wounded. He may have already received a fatal wound. Not 
every fatal wound just causes someone to drop dead on the spot like in the movies. So far, so good for Washington's account, but here's where things get interesting. According to the accounts of the French Native American allies, because right, there are some of them here, and they go to the French commanders, and what they say is that everyone stops firing when Jumonville uh, makes his call, and then he announces that he is an emissary and begins reading his message, but one of the Virginians shoots him dead where he stands, right in the middle of speaking. And then according to this account, uh, Tanakarissan's men step between the Virginians and the French to prevent further slaughter. Now, it could be that this account is self-serving. It's meant to make the Mingo look like innocent bystanders in the fight. But it's supported by accounts from a French eyewitness who's in the woods going to the bathroom when the camp gets surrounded. And he gives a similar account, but he runs away while Jumonville is reading his message and very much alive. So he doesn't tell us how Jumonville is killed. But according to accounts from one of the Virginians, as well as from a Catholic Iroquois who deserts Tanakarissan after this, there is a slightly different story. According to the Virginian soldier, the half-king himself strikes Jumonville over the head with his tomahawk, then washes his hands with the brains. The Catholic Iroquois account is even more colorful. According to that account, Jumonville is badly wounded in the initial volley and is lying on the ground in pain while Washington reads his diplomatic papers. And... While Washington is distracted, Tanakarissan walks up to Jumonville and says in perfect French, Tu n'es pas encore mort, mon père. Which means, you are not dead yet, my father. And then he violently strikes him several times with a hatchet. American historian Fred Anderson ties things up neatly in his book, Crucible of War, The Seven Years' War, and the Fate of Empire in British North America, 1754 through 1766, where he writes, quote, The last words Jumonville heard on earth were spoken in the language of ritual and diplomacy, which cast the French father, as the mediator, gift-giver, and alliance-maker among Indian peoples, Tanakarisan's metaphorical words, followed by his literal killing of the father, explicitly denied French authority and testified to the premeditation of his act. All of this enables us, at last, to understand Washington's behavior and attempt to conceal the truth of what happened in Jumonville's Glen. Despite his rank as a field officer, Washington had never before led troops in battle. Commanding a body of men about the size of a modern infantry platoon, he seems to have behaved like any ordinary second lieutenant in his first firefight. Excited and disoriented by combat, he later described the hiss of passing bullets as charming, and in the midst of more confusion, smoke, and noise than he would ever have experienced before, he could hardly have been in full control of himself and his men, let alone of the half-king and his warriors. The effect upon Washington of seeing Jumonville's cranium shattered is impossible to calculate, but it seems likely that the sight would have unmanned him long enough to allow the Indians to kill most of the wounded prisoners. That a massacre followed Jumonville's murder, moreover, is the only explanation consistent with the casualty figures that Washington himself gave. Shots fired in battle almost invariably produce two to four times as many wounds as deaths, as the three-to-one ratio among the Virginia casualties attests. The scanty training of Washington's men, no less the inaccuracy of their brown bass muskets, and the fact that men firing downhill will always overshoot their targets unless they have been instructed to aim low, 
makes it impossible to believe that the Virginians killed 13 men, or even as Washington maintained 10, while wounding only one. That a massacre followed the surrender of the French also makes sense of Washington's abbreviated account, which collapsed events to make it seem as if all of the French soldiers had been killed in battle. It also explains Washington's insistence that the French were spies, and his repeated urgings to Dinwiddie to believe nothing of what the prisoners said. Unquote. Regardless of what actually happened at the Battle of Jumonville Glen, Washington has just ordered his men to fire on a country that is at peace with them. His orders allowed for it, which is why he continues to lead men instead of getting into serious trouble. But while France and Britain remain officially at peace, a de facto state of war now exists on the North American continent. In the short term, Washington falls back to his temporary defenses, and he has his men erect a palisade wall, basically a bunch of thick wooden stakes driven into the ground. It's completed within a few weeks, and the Virginians call it Fort Necessity. And while it may be necessary to build a fort at this time, uh, Washington could have chosen a better location. See, Fort Necessity is in a terrible position. It is at the bottom of a valley, surrounded by elevated positions where the French could fire down over the palisade on the defenders. And while a stream runs through the valley, providing clean water for men and horses, the ground is wet and marshy, so it's tough to dig any good defensive trenches. The muddy walls of the trench will just continue to collapse as you try and dig out a position. Now, Washington does not intend to stay in this rinky-dink defensive position forever. Remember, he's still expecting uh, Colonel Fry to show up with all these reinforcements, and Dinwiddie has even told Washington that he expects reinforcements to come in from Pennsylvania and Maryland. Washington fully expects to be part of a force many hundreds of men strong, with cannons and with more seasoned officers to take overall command. And this force can then complete the original mission, taking control of the Ohio River headwaters, which means knocking the French out of Fort Duquesne. Now, eventually, Colonel Fry's men do arrive, but without Fry, although they do have some small swivel gun cannons. And with no help coming from Pennsylvania or Maryland, Washington decides to make an attempt on Fort Duquesne with the men and guns he has. But again we get back to the issue of roads. Even trying to haul these small swivel guns through the backwoods trails proves untenable. Pack horses become injured and need to be put down, and the men start having to haul some of the cannons themselves. Eventually, Tanakarissan decides that this is hopeless. Not only is Washington trying to launch an attack against a superior opponent in a strong defensive position, but Washington doesn't work well with the Native American warriors. He expects them to march and fight like Europeans, and he won't take the half-king's advice on how to better employ these soldiers. Finally, the British cause proves unpopular among the Mingo Iroquois in the Ohio River Valley. While the Iroquois Confederacy as a whole are no friends of the French, the French have already established a presence here now. If the Mingo side with the British, they will have to uproot their lives and live as refugees among white British settlers until the French are driven out of their lands. Better to accept the status quo and live in peace. And because of this unpopularity of the British cause, Tanakarissan is 
not able to recruit any more men. And frustrated by Washington and unpopular among his own people, Tanakarissen retires with his family further east in Pennsylvania. And sadly, he dies a few months later from an undetermined illness. And given subsequent events, he could have had quite the career if he had not gotten sick. Well, without their native allies, Washington and his officers decide that an attack on Fort Duquesne is hopeless. Worse, they have received word that a French force is coming down to attack them under the command of Jumonville's brother, Louis Coulon de Villiers. So they beat a hasty retreat back to Fort Necessity and arrived there only a day ahead of the French. July 3rd, 1754 is a gloomy, rainy day. Washington has his men digging a trench when the French army comes into sight at around 11 in the morning. And against Washington's 300 or so soldiers, 100 of whom are too sick to fight, there are 500 French-Canadian militia and 100 French-allied Native Americans. Washington attempts a straight fight and marches his men out to meet the French. But de Villiers is a more experienced commander than he is, and instead arrays his men along the heights to the left and right of the Virginians. And Washington's men walk right into the trap. As soon as they come between these two lines of French, they come under fire from both sides, and he orders them to fall back to the palisade. And there they continue digging trenches as best they can and trying to stay under cover. But then, in the early afternoon, it starts pouring rain. And in their muddy trench, Washington's men can't keep their muskets dry. And when they get wet, the complicated firing mechanism won't function. And when that happens on a flintlock musket, you have to extract the ball and black powder you've loaded, then thoroughly dry the barrel and pan, and then you have to reload your gun. This slows the Virginians down, and worse, they've only got two screws. Those are bullet extraction tools for getting your round out of the barrel. And, well, they have almost 300 men, so imagine how many guys are sitting around with ruined powder in their guns just waiting for a tool to extract it and dry everything out and by late afternoon most of the virginians are out of action not because they've been shot but because their muskets don't work and meanwhile the french are up on the forested ridges relatively dry and firing down on them from an elevated position in late afternoon, de Villiers sends a messenger to negotiate the terms of surrender. Washington sends out his friend and translator, Jacob Van Bram, to negotiate. De Villiers demands that the Virginians withdraw from French claimed lands, and he forces Washington to sign a surrender document. And Washington doesn't seem to know it at the time, but this document says that Jumonville was assassinated. Either way, he has no choice but to surrender. De Villiers warns that if the Virginians don't, well, then he can't answer for what his Native American allies might do to them. So Washington signs the surrender, and the Virginia Regiment returns to Virginia. At this point, all-out war is still avoidable. This could go down in history as just another unfortunate international incident that got smoothed over. It could have been a footnote to a footnote. But the Ohio River Valley is hugely important. Not only is it prime agricultural land, but the French already have a line of forts from the mouth of the St. Lawrence River in the Atlantic 
all the way to Detroit. They have another line of forts running up the Mississippi River from New Orleans in the south to the western Great Lakes. If they can control the Ohio River Valley, that's it. They can build forts through there, and they will have one contiguous, controllable territory inside of North America, and the British will be hemmed in on the North American East Coast and in their Hudson Bay colony. The French will effectively own North America by dominating all of its inland waterways and trade. And the British government isn't going to let that happen. At the time, the British government is heavily influenced by Prince William, the Duke of Cumberland. He's the third and youngest son of King George II, and by many accounts, he's the king's favorite. He's an experienced commander, having led an army against the Jacobite uprising at the Battle of Culloden in 1746, and led the British defense of the Austrian Netherlands during the War of the Austrian Succession. Cumberland likes the idea of fighting the French again, and he sees an opportunity to launch an undeclared war on France in the Americas. And to do this, he dispatches Major General Edward Braddock with two regiments of Irish troops. Now, Braddock himself has never seen battle, but he was a logistics officer for the elite Coldstream Guards, and has served as governor of Gibraltar in the past. Given how far-flung this operation to the Americas is, it makes sense that His Majesty's government would put a logistics expert in command. Braddock's ship arrives in Hampton Roads, Virginia, on February 22, 1755, and he immediately encounters some issues. See, he has supply ships on the way, he is a logistics expert after all, but he had expected some support from the other colonies. Instead, only Virginia Governor Dinwiddie is currently giving active support and supplying his troops. Furthermore, Braddock runs into a problem that Washington faced, and it's one I didn't mention before. See... The fight against the French has been led by wealthy businessmen with an interest in obtaining access to the Ohio River Valley. But those rich guys don't want to fight themselves. And so instead of a volunteer militia, they have to pay salaries to raise their quote-unquote militia. But these salaries aren't the best, and anyone with a decent job or even a plot of farmland has no interest in going off to war. So most of the soldiers are vagrants, to put it politely, and there are no physical fitness standards. A lot of these dudes are in their 50s, and even in their 60s, which is way too old for any soldier who's not a senior officer. This is a problem. Braddock can deal with limited local supplies. Again, he's already got those transport ships on the way, but he'd planned on raising two more local regiments. And now that he sees the poor quality of the colonial troops, he realizes he cannot employ them the same way he employs his Irish regular troops. Worse, the Irish troops are a little bit under strength and Braddock had been hoping to fill out his regiments with American recruits, but even the young, fit American soldiers have not been properly drilled, and so he can't integrate them into his own regiments. But Braddock does have an ace in the hole. The Royal Navy is already harassing French shipping, and has captured two troop ships bound from France to the New World. The French are going to be dealing with supply issues and will have to rely heavily on their native allies, although they are able to successfully send over four regiments of regular army troops this year. In April of 1755, 
Braddock meets with several colonial governors and their representatives in Alexandria, Virginia. There, he proposes an audacious plan to attack the French on three fronts. He intends to lead the first front himself in a direct assault on Fort Duquesne. This is an ambitious attack, and he hires 300 men with axes just to clear a serviceable road. Benjamin Franklin has paid for wagons to transport goods, and Braddock is even able to bring ten cannons with him. However, the Braddock expedition soon becomes a complete disaster. Braddock has studied traditional European warfare, which works well when you're dealing with thousands and thousands of troops in an open area. But this is densely wooded terrain, and he's leading around 2,100 men, which is not a large body of troops in European terms. So when his army is attacked by a smaller combined force of French Marines, Canadian militia, and hundreds of their allied Native American warriors, he clusters his men into groups to fire by rank. And that is the right thing to do if you're fighting in an open field. But when you're fighting in dense Allegheny Mountain woodland, massed fire does not work. Right? The Native Americans and the French and the Canadians are fighting from behind cover, and they avoid clustering in groups so as not to present an easy target. You pop out from behind the tree, take a shot, duck back behind the tree, and reload. And the British are still relying on massed fire, which don't work in these conditions, and moreover, the Redcoats' strong discipline works against them. As the French and Native Americans pick off their officers, less disciplined troops would immediately start to run, but... These soldiers continue to follow their training and fire by rank. Witnesses write of cases where one guy in a formation thinks he sees an Indian in some bushes, and he fires, and everyone else on the line fires away uselessly because they were trained to all fire together. And with small groups of troops trying to maneuver around each other, there are cases of friendly fire, where one group continues to fire away even though their friends are trying to march across their field of fire. Within three hours, nearly a thousand men, almost half of Braddock's force, are killed or wounded. Native American warriors now charge in with their tomahawks, terrifying the remaining soldiers into a retreat. General Braddock himself would be badly wounded and die later that night. George Washington would later write, quote, The shocking scenes which presented themselves in this night's march are not to be described. The dead, the dying, the groans, lamentations, and cries along the road of the wounded for help were enough to pierce a heart of adamant. The gloom and horror was not a little increased by the impervious darkness occasioned by the close shade of thick woods. This battle, called the Battle of the Monongahela, isn't that important to our story, but it's notable for how many famous people are present. In addition to George Washington, prominent Revolutionary War leaders Charles Lee and Horatio Gates are junior officers. Thomas Gage, who will command the British Army in the early part of the American Revolution, also fights in the battle, as do legendary frontiersmen Daniel Boone and Daniel Morgan. So much for the first prong of the British attack. The second Prong is far to the north on the Atlantic coast. Massachusetts Governor William Shirley raises a force of 2,000 men to send north to peninsular Nova Scotia. This area on the Atlantic coast is part of what's known as Acadia, 
which also includes much of modern-day New Brunswick. And the entire area is populated by people called Acadians. These are ethnically mixed French and Native American people who are mostly French-speaking Catholics. And they make up the majority of the population on Peninsular Nova Scotia. Even though this area is officially British, the actual British presence has been limited. It's mostly soldiers, not many civilians. And while the British and the French have officially been at peace these past several years, a priest named Jean-Louis Le Loutre has been leading a local rebellion. His followers include not just Acadians, but also many of the local Native American Mi'kmaq peoples who prefer French rule to British. Now, this Massachusetts governor, William Shirley, who is organizing the put-down of the Acadian Rebellion, he is a deeply committed Puritan with strong anti-Catholic leanings. He aims to stop this rebellion once and for all, and to do that, he is going to dispatch this 2,000-man force under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Robert Monckton, who is a colonial officer. And this colonial force reaches Nova Scotia on June 2, 1755, where they are joined by 400 more local troops. Their goal is to attack a recently constructed French fortification called Fort Beausjour, and they have a couple of advantages. For one thing, while the local Acadian population aren't exactly pro-British, when French Governor Louis Dupont du Chambon de Verger calls for Acadians to come to the defense, only around 300 show up. This is despite the fact that Father Jean-Louis Le Loutre himself is also at Fort Beausjour. The British also have the advantage of an inside man there, an English doctor named Thomas Pichon, who, for some reason, is employed as the doctor in this French fort. And he has been sending the British detailed information on the defenses so they know exactly what to expect. And finally, a British fleet is blockading the nearby French fortress at Louisbourg, so the French can't expect reinforcements anytime soon from anywhere in North America. And the British jump on this opportunity. They start building entrenchments around the city. And meanwhile, uh, Verger can't motivate his Acadian defenders to dig trenches of their own. Not even Father Le Loutre apparently can convince them to work, and so this leaves the work of preparing defenses to the little more than 150 French regular troops who are present. On June 13th, the British have finished building their entrenchments and start bombarding the fortress with explosive shells. These aren't just regular round iron cannonballs. When they hit the ground, they explode, sending metal shrapnel everywhere. One of these explosive shells hits the French officers' quarters, killing several officers along with a British prisoner who turns out to be the only British or colonial soldier killed during the entire siege. Things get worse when word gets out among the Acadians that Louisbourg is under siege and no reinforcements are coming. Verger was trying to keep that secret, and as soon as it gets out, 80 defenders desert Fort Beausjour on the night of June 14th. And Verger puts out an order that the men are not to discuss desertion, which seems like a clear sign that things are not going well. And two days later, on June 16th, Verger orders a surrender. The fall of Fort Beausjour is a big deal. If you picture Peninsular Nova Scotia on a map, 
It's a blob of land that is attached to mainland North America by a narrow stretch of land. Beausager commands this stretch of land, and the British have now cemented complete control of the peninsula. Worse, two more French forts in the area collapse soon after, eliminating any real French military infrastructure and forcing the French in the area to resort to guerrilla warfare. And Moreover, the fortress of Louisbourg is located on Cape Breton Island, which is the other part of modern-day Nova Scotia that is north of peninsular Nova Scotia. And with the fall of all other French fortifications in the area, the defenders of Louisbourg are completely cut off. And remember, they are under a British naval blockade. If Louisbourg falls... France will lose total control of the area around the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, which is their gateway to North America and the Great Lakes region. There goes that entire line of forts along the St. Lawrence River inland to the Great Lakes, right? If you can't control access to the St. Lawrence River... If, in fact, the British are controlling that, well, then you can't supply any of those forts. This is a big deal for the French. As for Father Le Loutre, the leader of the Acadian Rebellion, such as it is, well, he burns down the cathedral at Beausajour as soon as he hears of the surrender, rather than let the building fall into British hands. He then flees inland to Quebec, but later he is caught by the British and imprisoned until after the war. He will spend his final days in France working to assist Acadian refugees. Oh yes, there are going to be quite a few of those. See, at Governor Shirley's urging... Nova Scotia's Provincial Council and Lieutenant Governor Charles Lawrence are quick to follow up on the victory. On August 11, 1755, they issue a ruling that all Acadians and Native Americans are to be expelled from the territory. This is right in line with the overall anti-Catholic, strongly Puritan bent of William Shirley's campaign. Even Acadians who have sworn an oath of loyalty to King George are summarily deported. And deported is a weak word to describe what happens over the next few years. British soldiers burn Acadian crops and slaughter their livestock to force them to relocate. Micmac and Other local tribes who are allies of the Acadians attack British soldiers and colonists, and the French put out a bounty on British scalps, which predictably leads to massacres by Native Americans and reprisal massacres by the British. And by the end of the war, the Native Americans in the area will be all but gone, and so will the Acadian population. Instead, their farms will be taken over by New England colonists. It's not quite genocide. Most of the people are deported or driven off rather than killed outright. Uh, But it's disturbingly close to what we would call ethnic cleansing today. As for... For the Acadian people, well, they'll end up all over the place. Many will be deported to the 13 colonies, where British authorities disperse them throughout the general population, so there's no major Acadian population center where people can start mischief. Many are sent to England, even. And a large number are deported back to France. Some of those who are sent to France, resettle there in Europe, and the French king, Louis XV, even offers free land to displaced Acadians. But many who return to France 
still long for the frontier life, and so they resettle down to Louisiana in the Mississippi River Delta. And over time, the word Acadian becomes Cadian, which becomes Cajun. And that is where you get the Cajun people. Now, the third prong of this three-pronged British strategic offensive against New France, well, it is going to come in upstate New York. And because Braddock's war plans are absurdly complicated, this central prong of the attack is actually going to be a two-pronged attack in and of itself. First, William Shirley will personally lead an army west to capture the French fortifications at Fort Niagara. This will achieve two goals. First, it will cut off supplies to the French forts further inland along the Great Lakes, but more importantly, it cuts off the route of supplies for Fort Duquesne, which is that fort at modern-day Pittsburgh where the first prong of the attack was targeted. Unfortunately for Shirley, General Braddock's papers had been left behind in the retreat at the Monongahela, and these papers included the entire British war plan for 1755. Shirley, in turn, also learns that the French are planning to attack his own fortifications at Fort Oswego on Lake Ontario. This would actually cut the British off from a lot of Native American trade, right? They wouldn't be able to reach the Great Lakes, at least not very easily. And so instead of continuing with the planned assault west on Fort Niagara, Shirley instead decides to fortify Fort Oswego with as many men and weapons as possible. The other half of this attack in New York is to come at Lake Champlain, far to the north. Taking the French fortifications there would allow the French to directly threaten Montreal the next year. And to lead this attack, the British choose one of the most interesting people I've ever read about, Sir William Johnson. Johnson had immigrated to New York from Ireland in 1738 and was working for his uncle to establish a trading post west of Albany along the Mohawk River, which runs into the Hudson from far west in Mohawk country. That's a major Native American trading route. And Johnson soon discovers that an area on the north side of the river has even more trade than this area his uncle had sent to in the south, and so he buys his own land to the north of the river to trade with the natives. And this allows him to get the best prices and the best goods, since he is much closer to the Mohawk than the merchants downriver in Albany. And while he is living on the frontier as a trader, he soon becomes a good friend to the Mohawk tribe, which is part of the Iroquois Confederacy, and he learns their language, and he is famous for having many lovers and children of both European and Native American descent. In his will, Johnson even acknowledges heirs from one of his Native American mistresses, which is something few British nobles would ever consider. The Mohawk have even given him an honorary title as chief, along with the Iroquois name Waragahiyage, which I've seen translated both as a man who undertakes great things and chief big business. I don't know about you, but I like chief big business better. It has more of a ring to it. Now, Johnson is given two tasks— First, he is to rally as many Native American soldiers as he can to augment the local colonial troops. This will hopefully be easy for him, since he's good friends with Chief Hendrick, who we've already talked about. They actually have a lot in common. While William Johnson is a European who is assimilated to Native American culture, Chief Hendrick is a Native American with the Iroquois name Theonaguin, but 
he's assimilated to European culture. He has even been to England twice. Anyway, Johnson's second task is to advance north to Lake George, which is north of Albany but south of the French-held Lake Champlain. He can establish a base of operations there, and since Lake George drains into Lake Champlain, he can easily transport his army the rest of the way by water. And again, a picture is worth a thousand words. I could describe the geography here ad nauseum, but it's really best if you look at the map, which again is in the episode description. As far as raising help among the Iroquois goes, Johnson's efforts are mostly a failure. At this time, a good half or more of Iroquois land is under de facto French control, and most Iroquois don't trust the British. Well, not most of them, particularly not the chauvinist William Shirley. But after being rejected by many Iroquois chiefs, Johnson eventually writes an angry letter to the Earl of Halifax back in Great Britain, that is, the head of the Board of Trade. And he writes to this guy, and he calls Shirley, quote, a bad man abandoned to passion and enslaved by resentment, unquote. Another problem that Johnson runs into is that some of the Mohawk tribe, who you'll remember are a part of the Iroquois, well, some of these people live north of Lake Ontario, right? not just in French-held contested territory, but in well-established French territory. Many of them have converted to Catholicism and taken oaths of loyalty to the French king, so it would be problematic for them to join in a war on the British side. Even so, Johnson manages to convene a meeting of Native Americans to plead his case. In his book, Empires at War, the French and Indian War, and the Struggle for North America, 1754 to 1763, American historian William M. Fowler Jr. writes, quote, The gathering at Mount Johnson was the largest assemblage of Indians ever seen in New York. By some accounts, more than 1,000 men, women, and children camped in the orchards and fields surrounding Johnson's home. They have spoiled my meadow and destroy every green thing about my estate, he later complained. For nearly two weeks, from June 21st to July 4th, the Iroquois leaders sat with Johnson. Like the convening of Parliament or Muster Day in a New England town, the meeting was marked by endless rounds of drinking, eating, dancing, smoking, and debating. Both the English and Indians caucused among themselves and then returned to the public council meeting to lay before the audience opinions and proposals. A moment of high theater occurred when Johnson stood and told the chiefs, My war kettle is on the fire. My canoe is ready to put into the water. My gun is loaded, my sword by my side, and my axe sharpened. I desire and expect you will now take up the hatchet and join with us. Johnson's impassioned rhetoric notwithstanding, the nation's meeting at Mount Johnson were not yet ready to charge into the war. Their natural reluctance to commit themselves ripened to deep skepticism when the incoherent, unexpected, unintelligible, not to be credited, damned bad news of Braddock's disaster came up the river. In spite of the ill tidings, the elderly Mohawk chief Hendrick remained Johnson's faithful friend. Unquote. So, Johnson has a relatively small pool of willing Native Americans to recruit and he ends up only being able to recruit around 300 men, most of them followers of Chief Hendrick. This augments his force of approximately 3,500 colonial troops recruited from New York and New England. In addition to his manpower shortages, 
William Johnson also faces a major logistical challenge. See, he can't just sail or march his men all the way from Albany to Lake George. Albany is located where it is on the Hudson River for a reason. To go further north in New York, you need a shallow draft boat because the water is shallow. So Johnson has to have a bunch of shallow draft boats built. Uh, these are called bateaux. And he has to have his supplies offloaded uh, from any bigger ships to these bateaux. And then they can take the supplies north to a location that the Native Americans call the Great Carrying Place. This is the furthest north you can take a boat on the Hudson River before you reach the bottom of a small waterfall. If you want to keep going north, you have to get out of the water and literally carry your stuff about 16 miles over land to Lake George. The British have already built a fort here on the Hudson River at the Great Carrying Place, and the fort is called Fort Edward. And this fort is going to serve as a base of supply. And then from there, they are going to have to clear a road to Lake George. The old Iroquois trails are meant for men carrying canoes, not large river boats and artillery that need to be mounted on wheels and rolled across the land. And the process of building this road takes almost the entire summer, but by the end of September, the road is complete and supplies are already making their way slowly over land. At this point, Johnson has come to the conclusion that an attack on the French Fort St. Frederick on Lake Champlain is not going to be practical this year. He wants to build another fort or two on the shore of Lake George to protect his supply lines, and he wants to build a river galley to augment his forces. This is going to take until next year, and I should point out that Johnson comes to this conclusion because he, like Shirley, is aware that the French know of his plans. He had previously been hoping to take them by surprise, but since Braddock managed to leave behind the entire British war plan. Give him some credit, he was shot. But since his plans were lost, uh, there is now no chance of taking the French by surprise. In fact, the French are far more prepared than even William Johnson expects. German-born French general Ludwig August von Dieskau is leading a 1,500-strong mixed force of Native Americans, Canadians, and French regular troops south from Lake Champlain to take the fight to the British. And this Dieskau guy is a lot like William Johnson in that he has a lot of faith in his Native American warriors. He's not like most of the British officers we've talked about who have little to no trust in Native troops. But a lot of these guys are frankly pretty racist and think of the Native Americans as savages who could never go toe-to-toe -to -toe with disciplined European soldiers. But Dieskau does something that is unprecedented in colonial warfare. He leaves most of his French regulars in charge of guarding Fort St. Frederick. And only takes 200 elite grenadiers with him on his attack, relying mostly on a few hundred militia with a large body of native soldiers. When you think about it, this approach makes sense. The French regulars are familiar with European warfare and technology and artillery, which will be important if any British force attacks Fort St. Frederick when Dieskau is away. Right? Those men will have to man the walls and fire the cannons. Meanwhile, the Native Americans in his army know the lay of the land, and they're skilled at fighting from behind cover in small groups, which, again, is crucial when you're fighting in the woods. But it shows us that Dieskau values his Native allies as more than just garrison troops. Dieskau and his men do not come by water. They instead march over land past Lake George, 
circumventing Johnson's main army, which by this point is camped on the lake shore. Late in the afternoon, on September 7, 1755, Dieskau's men arrive at the Portage Road, several miles south of Lake George, but only three miles north of Fort Edward. Dieskau wants to attack the lightly defended fort directly. This would have two effects. First, it would cut off Johnson's supply lines entirely, trapping his army in French territory where they could be forced to surrender. Secondly, if the French can control Fort Edward, they can send an army downriver by boat to threaten Albany itself, which would block the British out of the Great Lakes region entirely. But Dieskau's Native American soldiers flat out refuse to attack the fort, which has tall, strong walls and which they rightly believe will be defended by cannons. On the other hand, the camp at Lake George is only defended by a breastwork, that's a chest-high wooden wall reinforced with an earthen berm on the outside. So, Dieskau agrees to march north along the road and attack Johnson's army the following day. But Johnson gets word from a scout that there is a French army in the vicinity of Fort Edward. He assumes that Dieskau is going to attack the fort, not the camp, so on the morning of September 8th, he dispatches a substantial force to reinforce the fort. This force includes 1,000 colonial troops under Colonel Ephraim Williams of Massachusetts and an advanced scouting and skirmishing force of 200 Mohawks commanded by Chief Hendrick. Returning to William J. Fowler's book, quote, Dieskau knew they were coming, for a deserter whom his men had captured on the road earlier that morning had told them of the column's advance. Now he blocked the road with his grenadier companies and positioned his Canadians and Indians in ambush ahead of them, choosing a spot about four miles south of the lake where the road dipped to pass along the floor of a ravine. Moving hurriedly, without flanking parties deployed because they did not expect to meet enemies until they neared Fort Edward, Hendricks, Mohawks, and Williams Provincials blundered into the trap a few minutes after ten. Old Hendrick, At 75, the veteran of more than half a century of warfare and diplomacy stopped when someone called out from the trees. Since the Canadian Mohawks and their New York kin generally refused to shed one another's blood, it seems likely that a Kaganawaga warrior was trying to warn him of his peril. But Hendrick's reply was cut short when, from another quarter, a shot rang out triggering a general exchange of fire in which he and about 30 other Mohawks were killed. Within the jaws of the ambush and exposed to musketry on both flanks, Colonel Williams tried to lead an assault up a bank of the ravine. He too was killed, together with about 50 of his men. Thus began the first skirmish of the Battle of Lake George, an episode New Englanders would come to call the Bloody Morning Scout. In size and position, the forces engaged were similar to those at the Battle of the Monongahela, but the outcome was quite different. The Mohawks, who had survived the first exchange of shots, quickly began a measured retreat, fighting their way to the rear along with perhaps a hundred of Williams' provincials. The rest of the column, provincials unencumbered by the discipline that had doomed Braddock's regulars to stand their ground, ran for their lives. While there was nothing heroic about it, theirs was an eminently rational response and indeed the one that saved the day. The sound of gunshots alerted the camp, and by the time the survivors came streaming back from the ambush, their compatriots had hastily reinforced the breastwork with bateau and overturned supply wagons. The sole regular officer with the expedition, a captain of engineers named William Eyre whom Braddock had assigned to supervise siege operations, quickly positioned four field pieces, those are small cannons, to cover the road. Dieskau's men came on in hot pursuit, then pulled up short at the edge of the clearing. To one observer in Johnson's camp, 
it seemed as if the enemy had been obliged to halt upon some disputes among their Indians. That was more or less accurate. The Conawagas had lost their leader, for Lagardeur de Saint-Pierre had been killed in the ambush. Now they did not wish to attack an entrenched camp, the defenders of which included hundreds of their Mohawk kinsmen. The Abenakis would not go forward without the Conawagas, and neither would the Canadians, who in general regulated themselves by the conduct of the Indians, went upon war parties with them. Dieskau seized control of this shaky situation by ordering his two grenadier companies to form a close-order column and charge the guns at the entrance of the camp. He intended to shame the wavering Indians and Canadians into attack, directing them to disperse around the perimeter of the camp and fire from the cover of logs and stumps. He gave orders to swarm over the breastwork whenever the opportunity presented itself. From the edge of the clearing to the mouth of Captain Ear's battery was perhaps 150 yards. Dieskau's grenadiers, the biggest, most imposing men of the Languedoc and Lorraine regiments, among the best soldiers in the French army, charged along the road across the clearing with bayonets fixed, six abreast and a column a hundred yards long. Magnificent in white uniforms and disciplined as only the cream of Europe's proudest army could be, they were not halfway to their goal when the grape shot charges of the English guns cut lanes, streets, and alleys through them, annihilating their order and forcing them back. From cover at the edge of the woods, the Indians and Canadians fired steadily at the defenders through much of the afternoon, but with little real effect. Dieskau, who sustained a crippling wound, remained on the field, but the failure of the charge and the loss of Lagardeur had doomed the attack. After four or five hours of increasingly uncoordinated firing, his men began to retreat without order. Unquote. Meanwhile, Johnson's sub-commander at Fort Edward, Colonel Joseph Blanchard, sees the smoke of battle in the distance and sends out a party of 120 men to see if they can help. As they move north along the road, these men run into the French camp, which is only lightly defended. They quickly overwhelm the defenders and capture all the French supplies. Then, they see a body of 300 French soldiers, most likely mixed Canadians and Native Americans, retreating from the main battle. So the British captain orders his men to hide in the woods outside the camp. When the French are all inside the camp, the British open fire from all directions. A few French manage to escape, but most are killed or captured. At the end of the day, William Johnson's army has managed to obliterate the French army in the region of Lake George. Albany is safe. General Dieskau is wounded and taken captive, and while Johnson is shot in the rear end during the fighting, it's just a flesh wound and he's going to be fine. But despite the British success at the Battle of Lake George, Johnson still has not achieved his main goal. North across Lake George and the adjoining channels, Lake Champlain remains firmly in French control and the French garrison at Fort St. Frederick remains intact. Johnson will have to content himself with building Fort William Henry on the south shore of Lake George and ordering supplies for next year's campaign. At the same time, the French begin building their own fort alongside the narrows between Lake George and Lake Champlain. This is an area where there are some rapids and you have to get out of your boat for just a couple of miles and go over land. And this fort blocking the area, Fort Carrion, better known to history as Fort Ticonderoga, will block any attack on Fort St. Frederick by water, at least for now. The 1755 campaign season is at an end, and January of 1756 brings significant changes. 
William Shirley has been fired as Commander-in-Chief of Colonial Forces and replaced by General John Campbell, the Earl of Luton, a Scottish nobleman who had fought on the side of the government during the Jacobite Rebellion. He's to be assisted by Major General James Abercrombie, another logistics expert in the mold of General Braddock. William Johnson is also being relieved of command, but he's not being punished. He's being promoted to Superintendent of Indian Affairs. No longer will the 13 colonies all have a say in negotiations with the Native Americans. From now on, the British Crown will conduct deals with them directly, and Johnson is now basically an ambassador. That said, most of his ambassadorial duties involve convincing the Iroquois to fight with the British and this will often mean joining their ranks and personally fighting by their sides. He's sort of a fighting ambassador. The French have also replaced their commander, sending in Louis-Joseph de Montcalm, a veteran of the Italian campaign of the War of the Austrian Succession. Montcalm, along with his troops, have successfully slipped past the British fleet and gotten into Canada. But... Before Montcalm and Loudon can even come into action, there has already been some fighting in 1756. On March 27th, French and allied Native American forces successfully attacked and demolished Fort Bull, a British defensive position guarding the portages between the Mohawk River and the headwaters of the Oswego River, which runs into Lake Ontario. This is basically the heart of the British transit route between Albany and Lake Ontario. And if you'll remember, there is a fort at Oswego on the Lake Ontario shore, which is where William Shirley has stored up men and fortifications. Well, by demolishing Fort Bull, the French have made it very dangerous for the civilian supply workers called bateau men to haul their boats and goods over land. Many are refusing to work altogether, and the supply line to Fort Oswego is now in critical danger. This threatens not just British control of the area, but also their trade with most of the Iroquois nations, and it gives the Iroquois another incentive to stay out of the war. Now, it's going to take some time for the new military commanders to settle in, so in the meantime, let's talk about diplomacy, because it's right here that the diplomatic revolution actually occurs in Europe. In January, Britain makes its alliance with Frederick the Great's Prussia in an attempt to shore up King George's territory in the electorate of Hanover against French attack. This is the last straw for Maria Theresa of Austria. She's already sick of the British for a number of reasons. Now they have made an alliance with her mortal enemy, and she secures her alliance with France. On May 17, 1756, Great Britain drops the facade altogether and declares war on France. They do this not because they want to start a land war in Europe, but because they want to blockade the French coast, and that would inevitably provoke a declaration of war from the French anyway. But any fool can see that a general European war is now inevitable. The French have a smaller navy than the British, but a bigger army. So if there's a blockade on, they're not going to try and run it and get troops to America. I mean, maybe they'll get some of that, but primarily they're going to look for some British possession that they can attack over land. And Hanover is not that far from France, which makes it an obvious target. This, in turn, will trigger the British alliance with Prussia, which in turn would bring Prussia and inevitably Austria into the war. Now, as we'll see in the next episode, that is not exactly how it goes down. But what I'm saying is that at this point, 
it is really tough to envision a scenario where Britain declares war on France in 1756 and a general European war does not break out. We are on the brink here in Europe, no matter how you cut it. Now, let's get back to the situation in the Americas. Louis-Joseph de Montcalm is known as a brave and aggressive fighter and a great tactician. Unfortunately, he is what could be charitably called a French chauvinist. He thinks of the Canadians as backwater provincials, and he doesn't trust the Canadian militia to be effective. The Native Americans are completely alien to him, and he never makes any effort to understand their ways. And his treatment of the natives throughout the war will slowly alienate the French native allies. This is a major problem. The British colonists in the Americas outnumber French colonists more than five to one. The greatest strength of the French in North America is their strong relationship with the Native Americans. This includes the Algonquin tribe, the Mi'kmaq, the Lenape, the Ottawa, the Shawnee, the Abenaki, and the Algonquian-speaking tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy. Pretty much the only tribes the French aren't on great terms with are the Six Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy. And the French have managed to do this because of the way they've treated the Native Americans. The Spanish and Portuguese, for example, are famous for their brutal colonizations of South and Central America, wiping out local cultures, enslaving people, destroying their religious idols, right? We can go on and on and on. And the British behavior towards the Native Americans has certainly been a cut above that, but at best, it's been marked by a sort of uh, benevolent neglect, again, with the exception of the Iroquois, who they try to say on good terms with. But other than that, the British have tended just to not engage with the Native Americans, which inevitably means that at some point their colonists enter into conflict with a particular tribe and push them out of an area, right? The French are much better at dealing with these relations. They have dealt with the natives in a totally different way, with a few exceptions, some of which we've covered in this episode. They have pursued a policy of trade and peaceful relations. Native Americans are encouraged to convert to Catholicism, and many French missionaries go to North America... And while converting to Catholicism and speaking French is by no means required, the conversion in particular comes with certain benefits. Since 1627, any Native Americans who converted to Catholicism are considered Native Frenchmen. They can get on a boat and move to Paris if they want to and not be treated differently than anyone else. And by 1755, there is a large population of Catholic Native Americans, uh, most of whom uh, speak French as a second language. And I don't just mean people who have settled in French towns. I mean in the tribal villages deep in the hinterland. And this cultural exchange goes both ways. There is a significant mixed-race population in that area as well as in the towns. And nobody thinks anything of it. For an 18th century colonial empire, New France is downright progressive. But Louis-Joseph de Montcalm does not understand this at all. Native American diplomacy involves days of meetings, ceremonies, and gift-giving rituals, and Montcalm can't be bothered. Rather than show respect for his Native allies, he frequently flouts Native American social conventions, and this is going to get him in trouble. By comparison, the new British commander, the Earl of Luton, is chosen specifically for his ability to get along with the locals. While the British have William Johnson to handle their Native American diplomacy, 
Luton's job is to get all the colonial governors and assemblies working together. But he has some flaws of his own. Returning now to Fowler's book, quote, Chosen in part because of his affability, a trait potentially useful in dealing with the less affable provincial assemblies, Luton spent his days trying to sort out Shirley's botched accounts and cajoling colonial authorities to send men and supplies to counter the French build-up to the north. More plotting than aggressive, he was a devil for detail. He drafted every letter personally. John Appy, his hard-pressed secretary, complained about putting 15-hour days. Luton dismissed him as a whiner and suggested that he ought to spend less time partying and more time sleeping. In the meantime, the commander was the first man up every morning. Luden's passion for organization and paperwork was admirable in an logistician, but it was a handicap for a field commander. He seemed more interested in closing in on a report than engaging the enemy. One American noted that the general was like St. George upon the signposts, always on horseback, but never advancing. Unquote. But Luton isn't the first British commander to arrive in North America. His deputy, General James Abercrombie, arrives in Albany first on June 25, 1756. By this point, a large colonial army of around 7,000 men has already amassed to the north at Lake George, ready to take the fight to the French at Fort Ticonderoga. I'm sorry, it's still Fort Carrion. Anyway, uh, the situation at Fort Oswego is deteriorating at the same time. Right? This fort is far to the west, they're cut off, and the situation is desperate. The fort's commander... Colonel James Mercer knows it's only a matter of time before the French attack, and he's sending desperate messages to Albany asking for help. Abercrombie has around 3,000 British regulars with him. He could send them to support an attack on Fort Carrion slash Ticonderoga, or he could help at Fort Oswego. So what does he do? Nothing. He does nothing, because he doesn't want to do anything without Luton's explicit approval. And while Abercrombie dithers, Montcalm is on the move. He arrived in Montreal back in May, and by the time Luton arrives in Albany on July 22nd with 6,000 more troops, it's too late. They have no time to deploy. On August 8th, Montcalm embarks for Fort Oswego with a force of 3,000 men, mostly regulars, but including around 250 Native American militia. They travel along the lakeshore to avoid detection and succeed until August 11th when a small British patrol boat spots them. But by now, Montcalm is close enough to attack, Here's how Fred Anderson describes the British defenses, which I have been calling Fort Oswego, but is actually three distinct buildings. Quote, Mercer knew that the French were advancing on him. He split his 1,200 men among three positions, Fort Ontario, George, and Oswego. The three strongholds stood within cannon shot of one another and were close enough to be mutually supporting. Each, however, by itself was extraordinarily vulnerable. Ontario, the key position, was located on the north bank of the Oswego River, on a 70-foot bluff overlooking the lake. About a quarter mile away, across the river on the south bank, stood Fort Oswego, a trading house defended by a blockhouse surrounded by a crumbling stone wall. In a desperate attempt to fortify it, Mercer ordered two cannon placed on its roof. He abandoned that plan when the recoil of the cannon threatened to collapse the roof. The third point of this fragile trident was Fort George, about 800 feet to the northwest of Fort Oswego. 
It was a poorly constructed palisade with earthworks on two sides. The militia who garrisoned it thought it so little of the structure that they dubbed it Fort Rascal. Unquote. Montcalm attacks Fort Ontario first. That's the fort on the high ground. He uses traditional European siege tactics, and he starts digging a trench around the building. By late afternoon on August 13th, the trench has almost completely surrounded Fort Ontario. Realizing that his men there are about to be cut off, Colonel Mercer orders his cannons to lay down as much fire as they can, and... Under cover of that fire, he withdraws his men from Fort Ontario and across the river, right in front of the French. But Montcalm just moves his own cannons up into Fort Ontario and starts firing down across the river at Fort Oswego, which they commence on the morning of August 14th. Meanwhile, Montcalm also sends a bunch of infantry down to the south to a spot where they can across the river on foot. These men come up from the south. They overrun Fort George. They surround Fort Oswego. All of a sudden, the British are down to the last of three defensive positions. Colonel Mercer is killed by a French explosive shell during the fighting. His Subcommander, Lieutenant Colonel John Littlehales, surrenders not long afterwards. Hundreds of Native Americans and French soldiers storm the fort, break into the rum, and get drunk. And in the aftermath of this, some British attempt to escape and are tomahawked. A handful of Abenaki also beat Lieutenant Colonel Littlehales severely claiming that he is a coward who surrendered too quickly. Louis-Joseph de Montcalm puts a stop to the violence and lets the British leave in peace. All told, 1,700 British start their long march back to British territory. And if you've noticed that that number is higher than the 1,200 defenders, that's because there are women and even children in the fort. Montcalm screws up. He does not allow his native allies to loot the fort. This might be confusing, but it's important for a couple of reasons, and the first is monetary. The French Native American allies aren't being paid, at least not directly. They get paid by taking a share of the loot during a victory. Instead, Montcalm lets the British keep all their personal possessions and takes all the military equipment for the French. Anything else, unneeded canoes, construction equipment, and so on, he orders destroyed. And you'll notice that none of this loot goes to the Native Americans, so they get the accurate perception that Montcalm expects them to work for free. And... If that's not bad enough, there's a second social reason that the Native Americans expect to loot, and that is that the Native Americans of northeastern North America have a practice of adoption that the Europeans view as nothing more than abduction. After a battle, the victors will take captives, typically young females from their defeated enemy. These captives are then adopted into the tribe to replace the warriors who were lost in the battle. But Montcalm doesn't let his native allies take captives either. That's not to say that it doesn't happen when he's not looking, but he's telling them that they can't engage in a practice that is central to Native American warfare. This shocks them and it starts to drive a wedge between them and the French. But for the time being, Montcalm has taken control of all of what is now western and central New York State, and he is in a good position to strike again at the British the next year. For his part, Luton does nothing 
for all of 1756. This is partially because of his sluggish command style, but it's also because he gets tied up in colonial politics. See, Loudon doesn't trust the colonial militia any more than Montcalm trusts his Canadian militia. And he's outraged that William Shirley has allowed mere provincials to lead the attack on Lake Champlain. Luton wants to subordinate the colonial forces to the British regulars so that even the most senior colonial officer will rank as a mere captain to be commanded around by a British major. This is unacceptable to the colonials. For one thing, the idea that Senior, experienced colonial officers should have to defer to younger, inexperienced British officers is simply insulting. For another thing, the British regular army has extremely strict discipline with severe punishments even for minor infractions. The colonials, on the other hand, have signed service agreements that outline a much looser discipline. If these men are subjected to floggings for minor breaches of discipline, there is going to be a riot. And you really don't want your own troops to be rioting. A group of colonial officers comes south from Lake George to explain this to Luden, and he comes up with a compromise that allows everybody to save face. The colonial forces are to be commanded only by their own officers, who, in turn, swear to follow any royal commands. This gets rid of the discipline issue and the rank issue while still subordinating the colonial forces to Luden's command. And at the same time, it allows the Lake George expedition to proceed but the delay means another year of waiting. This isn't to say that Luden offers the expedition no support, but he is a logistical expert, so his help is logistical. Returning to Fred Anderson's account, quote, Luton undertook the measures without which no successful campaign could ever be mounted against the French, widening roads and improving portages, creating an army wagon train to supplement the services of the expensive and often unreliable civilian wagoners, building standardized supply bateaux and scows, and constructing way stations to shelter supplies and men in transit from station to station. The fall in the cost of moving supplies offers the best index of Luden's success in improving the efficiency of the transport system. In 1756, it had cost nearly six pence a mile to move a 200-weight barrel of beef from Albany to Lake George, which meant that the army was spending more than half the value of the beef itself to carry it 60 miles. By the end of 1757, the same barrel could be transported over the same route for less than two pence a mile. Unquote. And for those of you who are keeping score at home... That is a cost reduction of about 67%. That is pretty substantial. But besides his logistical efforts, Luden mostly spends the end of 1756 and early 1757 planning a naval attack on the French fortress of Louisbourg on the Atlantic. This is, again, that fortress on the uh, island that is nowadays uh, known as uh, Northern <laughs> Nova Scotia, and at this time it is the only French fortification commanding access to the St. Lawrence River and the North American interior. Now, the British blockade of two years ago has since been broken off, but if Luton's regulars can take Louisbourg, the British will be able to exercise complete control over the opening of the St. Lawrence River. And this would cut off French Canada from the sea, shut down their supplies, and prevent the arrival of any new regular troops. But unfortunately for Loudon, the French have heavily defended Louisbourg with a naval flotilla. They know its importance, and they're not going to let the British blockade it again. It 
least if not they have anything to say about it. And while the British Navy outclasses the French Navy on the global level, this local flotilla far outclasses Luden's small fleet, and he's forced to return to Albany with nothing to show for it. While he's gone, disaster strikes the British at the south end of Lake George. By early August 1757, the defenders at Fort William Henry number around 2,500, mostly militia, but with around 450 regulars. The fort itself had already come under a light French attack during the winter of 1756 to 1757. But this winter attack did not include artillery, and Fort William Henry is a wooden structure that can stand up to small arms, but not artillery. And in the summer of 1757, Louis-Joseph de Montcalm moves in on Fort William Henry with approximately 8,000 troops, plus artillery, and 1,800 or so Native American allies. On August 3rd, he lands troops on the nearby shoreline and begins digging siege trenches, with the assistance of his Native American troops who had marched ahead over land to meet him. Meanwhile, a detachment of Canadian militia, who had also come south over land, moved south to block the road from Fort Edward. This blocks the defenders of Fort William Henry from any kind of resupply up the Hudson River and across the portage. And at this point, as is traditional, Montcalm sends the British commander, Lieutenant Colonel George Monroe, an offer to accept his surrender. Monroe sends back a message refusing to surrender. He also sends out a courier to run south to Fort Edward and report the situation to his commanding officer, General Webb. Now, Webb only has 1,600 men at his disposal. Uh, roughly half the number of people who are already at Fort William Henry. And he does not want to risk them in a relief effort, so he sends back a messenger ordering Monroe to surrender on the best terms possible. Unfortunately, this courier with the message is shot by a French scout who takes the message to Montcalm, and it does not get to the British commander, Lieutenant Colonel Monroe. For the next few days, the French trenches and cannons slowly advance closer to Fort William Henry's wooden walls, and by August 7th, most of the defending cannons have been destroyed, and Montcalm sends an envoy to Monroe to negotiate a surrender. The envoy brings with him the orders from General Webb telling Monroe to do just that. And so they negotiate terms, but Monroe still refuses to actually order the surrender until the French have breached the walls. This is a matter of honor in European warfare, and they have brought the idea with them to the New World. On August 9th, the French cannons are within 250 yards of the fort's wooden wall, and they blow a hole in it, and almost immediately the British run up the white flag. And now we will see the consequences of Montcalm's failure to communicate with his Native American allies. William F. Fowler Jr. writes, quote, At noon on the 9th, William Henry was turned over to the French. The soldiers in the fort laid down their arms and marched out to a fortified encampment. A number of wounded who were unable to walk were left behind. Within minutes, several Indians forced their way past French sentries and into the fort. As the departing troops reached the encampment, they heard screams from behind. Father Robard reported that he saw a warrior dash from the building where the wounded had been gathered carrying a human head, 
from which trickled streams of blood. Other warriors burst through the gate and went for the military stores and provisions, including rum. A few French guards tried to restrain them, a move the Indians correctly viewed as a ploy so that the soldiers could take the spoils for themselves. While the Indians and French pillaged the fort, Monroe and his men remained in the camp. Montcalm posted sentries to keep the British in and the Indians out. The Indians, however, muscled their way past the French, and all afternoon and into the evening, dozens of drunk and angry Indians marauded among the terrified prisoners, taunting them and stealing their personal goods. Montcalm and his officers attempted to bring order, but with so many different tribes and only a handful of interpreters, their task was nearly impossible. Unquote. The concurrent negotiations are relatively civil. The British and French officers sit down to a nice dinner together, chat about life in North America, and come to an amiable surrender agreement. The British will be free to keep all their belongings, including their muskets and a single symbolic cannon and they can retreat with full military honors. They will swear not to go to war against the French for the next 18 months, which is not an uncommon surrender condition in these days, and in turn the British agree to turn over some French prisoners. But while all the officers are eating together, the Native American leaders are conspicuously left out and these people start to wonder if now that the battle is over, the Europeans might be conspiring against them. I mean, the French have been all right in the past, but who is this guy Montcalm? Why is he sitting down for dinner with our enemies after a battle and leaving us out? The disorder in the camp gets worse. Montcalm fears he can't protect the British, so rather than let the British leave in the morning as previously planned, he has his men wake them in the wee hours and tell them to start moving. But it takes until daybreak to get everybody ready. Fred Anderson writes, quote, Dawn brought all the mischief the Anglo-Americans had feared. As the regulars prepared to lead the column down the road to Fort Edward, hundreds of warriors armed with knives, tomahawks, and other weapons swarmed around them, demanding that they surrender arms, equipment, and clothing. Other Indians entered the entrenched camp, where the provincial troops and camp followers anxiously awaited the order to march, and began carrying off not only property, but all the blacks, women, and children they could find among the camp followers. When at last the column began to move out at around 5 a.m., the regulars in the lead marched alongside the column's French escort, and thus were spared the worst of the violence that followed. The provincials at the rear of the column, however, lacked all protection, and found themselves beset on every side. Within minutes... Indians had seized, killed, and scalped the wounded from the provincial companies, and strimped others of clothes, money, and possessions. As noise and confusion mounted, discipline disintegrated. Terrified men and women huddled together, trying as best they could to defend themselves. Then, with a whoop that witnesses took to be a signal, dozens of warriors began to tomahawk the most exposed groups at the rear of the column. The killing lasted only a few minutes, but more lives would be lost in the panic that followed. Fry's regiment dissolved in chaos as men bolted, screaming in every direction, some into the woods, others toward the French camp, others back to the fort, with Indians in hot pursuit. Since prisoners were more valuable than trophies, most of those whom the Indians caught were in less immediate danger than they thought. When Montcalm and the other French senior officers ran up to stem the disorder, however, they first tried to intervene and free the captives, only to find that the result was often fatal. 
Many warriors preferred to kill their captives and take trophies rather than be deprived of them altogether. By the time order could be restored, as many as 185 soldiers and camp followers had been killed, and a much larger number, between 300 and 500, had been taken captive. Another 300 to 500 provincials and regulars had found refuge with the French. The rest either fled down the road or escaped into the woods, and eventually made their way toward Fort Edward. As for the Indians, virtually all of them left without delay once they had secured the prisoners, scalps, and plunder they had earned in battle. By sunset on August 10th, only about 300 domesticated Abenakis and Nipissings remained with Montcalm's army. The other 1,300 warriors and their captives were already paddling north on the first leg of the long journey home. Unquote. Despite his efforts to stop the massacre, it's tough not to blame Montcalm for what happened. If he had just put in the effort to understand his Native American allies, he could have prevented things from going this far. But as they say... Hindsight is twenty twenty. It's worth noting that Sir William Johnson, chief big business, is furious about the fall of Fort William Henry, which you'll recall he built. During the battle, he arrives at Fort Edward with a force of 1,600 Native American and colonial troops, and he begs General Webb to let him go assist. And when Webb refuses, Johnson supposedly drops his pants in front of him as an insult and calls him a coward. And both Webb and the head British commander Luton will be recalled to England by the end of the year. But the fall of Fort William Henry is a major blow to the British. Instead of sending a British force up through Lake George and Lake Champlain to strike at the heart of Canada, they now face the opposite threat. What if a French force takes the same route? If that happens, Fort Edward is all that stands between them and Albany. At the end of 1757, the British are in a poor position in North America. But the war in Europe has now been raging for nearly a year and a half. Fighting has also broken out between British and French regular forces and trade companies on the Indian subcontinent. As I said, the Seven Years' War is a massive conflict that involves the entire globe. But if nothing else, I hope I've proven one thing. The French and Indian War and the Seven Years' War are one and the same. We'll talk about events like the Third Silesian War, which is the central European theater of the war. The Indian War is called the Third Carnatic War or the Bengal War, depending on which part of India you're in, and the Pomeranian War is what we call the Northern Theater of the War. But for some reason, many historians still give the French and Indian War a special status, as if it's its own unique war, but it's not. It's just the North American theater of the Seven Years' War. And conflict in North America actually leads directly to events in Europe. We'll talk about those events in part two of World War Zero. Hello again. It's me, Dan. This is a friendly reminder that if you're only listening to the audio podcast, you're not getting all of my content. 
I also have a Patreon channel called Dan's War College. Each month, I break down a historical battle, weapon, or tactic and explain how it works. This is a video series with maps, graphics, and other helpful visual aids, and you can get it all for just $5 a month. We've done 10 episodes so far, and some of these have even been patron requests, because I do take requests. You can find the link to the Patreon channel in the episode description. And if you're on the fence, episode 5 of Dan's War College is currently publicly available, so you can check that one out and get a taste for what the channel is like. Of course, not everybody wants to spend $5 a month for a monthly video, and who can blame you? There are so many channels and subscription services out there that it's just impossible to sign up for all of them. But if you still want to support the show, you can share it with your friends or post a link on social media. Shows like this grow by word of mouth. And if the channel's growth is any indication, you guys are great advertisers. Thanks so much, and please keep it up. And if your podcast service lets you leave a review, please do so. If you want to follow Relevant History on social media, you can find links in the description for that as well. Or just go to Twitter and find at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast. If you want to send me an email, you can write to Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast at gmail.com. Tell me what you liked, or if you think I got something wrong, tell me that too. You can also visit the show's website at dantollerpodcast.com. Once again, that's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.